This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They felt it. Right. So and I just thought, well, I figured it out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's storyteller is Ari Daniel Shapiro. The story was recorded in January 2012 at Union Hall in Brooklyn. The theme of the event was The Wilderness. So back in the summer of 2004, I found myself north of the Arctic Circle on Baffin Island in Canada. Most of Baffin Island is, uh, is wilderness. There's nothing out there. There are a couple of towns. And where I was spending my time with a field group, a science field group, uh, there was nothing. There was just kind of uh, a ro- brown, rocky uh, land, a beach, and then uh, the water, because Admiralty Inlet is uh, where we were staying, and it kind of cuts into the northern part of Baffin Island. And behind us, there was this kind of rocky plateau. And the field team, we'd set up this uh, kind of five or six tents where we were sleeping. Uh, We had a cook tent where we were eating our meals and hanging out, and a science tent where we were getting all of our equipment ready. And the first night that I was there, I remember staring at this bucket of seawater. My science instrument that I brought up was inside it, and I was trying to see if it was going to work. I'm looking at this bucket of water, hoping that the thing would work, knowing that that it wouldn't, and wondering how the hell I'd gotten myself into this predicament. So to back up, I used to study whales. I studied how they communicated and how they behaved. And I had this opportunity after the first full year of graduate school to go up to Baffin Island to study narwhals, which are a kind of Arctic whale. Uh, Are you guys familiar with narwhals? Okay, good. Yeah, they're a gray whale. They, their probably most distinguishing characteristic is the tusk, which is this modified tooth that bores out and through the upper lip. And it's where the myth the unicorns came from. Uh, narwhal tusks look like unicorn horns, and, uh, and, and, the, and the explorers kind of used to go out and collect them and bring them back and say they came from unicorns. So, uh, so I was going to go up and study these study the narwhals, and the lab that I was in, we were working with these uh, tags called D-tags, about the size of a cell phone uh, by themselves, but in their housing, they were about the size of your shoe, and they had suction cups on them, and the idea, is, uh, the idea was we would mount these to the, ec- the outside of the whale, non-invasively, the suction cups just stick, and it records the 3D movements of the animal, and also records the vocalizations of the animal, uh, but the, the thing is that you have to get the tag back in order to get the data, because it, it samples it a really high rate. And so uh, so you uh, attach it to the animal. There's a release mechanism, a burn wire that burns off, and then the tag uh, floats to the surface. And you take a dip net, scoop it up, bring it back, offload the data, get it on your computer, delete it from the tag, and redeploy so you can recycle the, the tag. So the idea was that I was going to go out and put these tags uh, on, on wild narwhals to see how they behaved in Baffin Island. And I had never done... Uh, I had never been on my own, you know, doing field work before. Uh, and, and, and so before I left, um, oh, the other thing I should mention is that the release wire, the burn wire, had been tested in warm water and worked great. But it had never been tested in cold water before. And so we didn't know that it wouldn't work, and it was a great opportunity for me to go. So before I left, I went and I talked to the lead engineer uh, who, who designed the DTAG, who reminded me a lot of Crocodile Dundee. He's tall. Like very confident, a little intimidating. He's actually from New Zealand, uh, and uh, and and he and he was saying, you know, good luck on the project. There's a there's a lot 
uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the hopes are high for your work. And the uh, Italian, um, so one of the Italians in our lab, uh, before I left, he said something to the effect of, don't fuck it up. So, <laughs> and, and I knew that a lot of my, uh, you know, uh, that to be able to use these tags in the future on other animals, in other situations, you know, really relied on how well I did on this one. Anyway, so I, so I fly all the way up there. I get 2,000 miles away from Boston in Woods Hole, where I was based, on Baffin Island. And I was there with a team. It wasn't just me. There were uh, a few uh, folks from Denmark. They called themselves the Great Danes. There was a guy from Canada as well. They'd been tagging narwhals with other types of tags for a while. Uh, there was a woman from a zoo in Canada, a guy from SeaWorld who Literally, his job is to fly in airplanes marine mammals from one sea world to another, killer whales, dolphins. Uh, at, there was a, another fellow named Mehdi from uh, National Geographic, who, an engineer who designed this critter cam, which uh, is a video camera that mounts onto wild animals and records where they move. So it was a really good team. But as I say, the first night, I'm sitting there with this bucket of water from the Admiralty Inlet where we were going to deploy these tags, and the burn wire was not burning, and if it didn't burn, the tag wouldn't come off. And, I, and, and I, I didn't have an engineering background. I didn't know how to fix this thing. So the first couple of days, the weather was bad. We couldn't actually do any of the work. And I was really relieved because every day that would pass, although I was up there for three weeks, you know, that every day that would pass would be another day that uh, with, with bad weather, I wouldn't have to put the tag out. But sure enough, the weather cleared, you know, on day four or five. Now, in the meantime, Mehdi had, and I had, really, it was just Mehdi, working on coming up with, with a solution to get the D-tag to release. And and he came up with something where when the, t when the critter cam came off, it would kind of pull the release mechanism of the D-tag, and the idea was both would kind of come floating off. So, um, so we had a plan. The way that we caught the narwhals to actually uh, put the tags on, we had a, a, a net that was perpendicular to the shoreline with buoys on top. And when the narwhals swam into Admiralty Inlet, the buoys and, and, hit and, and would encounter the net, the net would dip below, the buoys would kind of drop below the surface of the water. We would know that narwhals were there. We'd zip out with a Zodiac, an inflatable boat, bring the net and the narwhal in, untangle it, uh, and then do our work with it. So this was the first time we actually had a narwhal caught in the net. We brought it to shore. It's just beautiful. I mean, the animal's gray, but it's got all these different kind of colors and lines on it. And the tusk, you know, that the, the unicorn horn was, was right there in front of me. So they're doing the blood work up on the animal. They're attaching the, the satellite tag. And at the very last minute, we put the critter cam and the D tag on the animal, and we set it loose. And when the tag's at the surface, it beeps. So you know when it's at the surface, and when it goes underwater, there's nothing. So we hear the kind of beep, beep as the animal surfaces, and then nothing, and then a couple minutes later, beep, beep. So we know it's attached to the animal, and it heads off. Well, the weather kicked up. And although the tag released after the couple of hours that we had programmed, the, programmed it for, we weren't able to go get it. Until the next day, when Mehdi went out with a couple of the, uh, the Inuit uh, that we were working with on the team uh, on their boat to go retrieve them. I wasn't allowed to because the boat wasn't insured, and my graduate program said you can't go out on the boat. So Mehdi would go out with a couple of Inuits. And so he goes out, and I'm waiting for a few hours. He comes back. I'm in the cook tent. He opens the door, and he's got nothing. And my heart just sunk. And then he reaches down. And he picks, he like hit it, you know, and he picks the tag up and he, and he brought, and I gave him a hug and I went, now the critter cam, they, he actually lost that. He doesn't know what happened to the critter cam, <laughs> but the D tag came back. So I go to the science tent, I download the data, as beautiful dive pattern, you know, and there's sounds from the narwhal. So I'm, I'm thrilled, you know. So then the next day we get another animal uh, and, and we're ready to tag again. This time Mehdi said, we're going to tether the critter cam to the D tag so that when one comes off, the other one stays with it and we don't lose them. Or we, or we lose both. So, uh, so, we, so we let the animal go and, um, with, with the tags on. And, uh, and then we, we hear the beep beep. And it should have come off after a couple hours. But it, it's not coming off. We hear like the beep beep. We're still on shore, you know, hearing it from the distance. And it goes like three hours, four hours, six hours, ten hours. It's not coming off. And then it was like the next day we still hear the intermittent beeping. 
until finally, I think it was the day after that, we hear the kind of constant beeping. So Mehdi gets in the boat with the Inuit, to a couple of Inuit men, and he goes out, and he comes back with both the critter cam and the D-tag. And I'm thrilled, so I take the D-tag back to the science hut, and I go to offload the data, and it's not working. I can't get the tag to turn on. And uh, so and I, I, I'm trying, and so finally I open up the housing, and I have the tag in front of me, and I look inside, and it's, it's like it's stuffed with sand. And the tag's sealed. So I, now what had actually happened was it had, it had sprung some sort of leak. The electronics had corroded, and the stuff on the inside was this, like, corroded electronics that looked like grit. So I satellite called back to Woods Hole and talked with one of the engineers in the lab and said, what am I going to do? He said, don't touch it. Bring it back in a couple of weeks, and we'll try to salvage it. I was sent up there with three tags. So this was one tag down. So I didn't tag for the rest of the field season. I was really scared about putting another one out. The next opportunity that presented itself where I felt ready was the last night we were in the field. They were forecasting a tremendous snowstorm, and they said, you have a choice. You can put a tag out or not. Mehdi did not want to put his critter cam out anymore. He'd already lost one. I decided to put the tag out on its own. I had been testing it a little bit with the release. It seemed to be corroding, uh, uh, burning a little bit. Excuse me, so it seemed okay. So I, I put it on the animal, and we set it out into the, into the night. The storm blew in. I heard it going off in the distance. So I go to sleep. The next morning I wake up, and it's not off the animal. And at this point, we've got to clear out. A twin otter, this kind of double propeller plane, is going to pick us up. We have to load all our equipment up. And we were going to a base in a neighboring island. And uh, we were going to wait there for a few days. So the tag wasn't lost necessarily, but we were moving further away from it. So I get on this twin otter. We fly to the base. And I go to bed that night, and I wake up the next morning. I mean, not even. You know, it's like, you know when you're, like, really upset about something? You wake up, and you just, I just felt this feeling of dread. And, uh, and I think, you know, I don't know what this Italian guy meant in the lab, but I'm pretty sure that when you bring back one tag clogged full of grit and you lose another one in the middle of the Arctic, you pretty much fucked it up. So I that we're like, what are we going to do? So the first thing we did, which really didn't solve matters, is we made a, we made a little wanted sign uh, <laughs> that said, reward critter cam worth 1,000, D tag 700, and we put these up around the base. And, you know, it's not like it's a lost cat. They're not just going to – this was – I think we were just kind of like killing time trying to feel useful. So obviously, this, you know, th- that didn't work. And so now we did have this other opportunity. There were walrus researchers that were up there with a helicopter. And the thought was if we could just borrow the helicopter and we could go out, fly into the inlet, and try to find the tag. So I'm on the phone with my advisor trying to – kind of plan this thing out, and we come up with this idea, well, if someone, namely me, could get in the helicopter, lean out the side of the thing with a dip net, hovering over the frigid water, you know, the water that, like, you die right, like, even before you hit it, you know, (laughs) and so, and and, and retrieve the tag. Somehow, this would be covered by insurance, but me riding in the boat with the Inuits wasn't. So we were like, okay, that's not going to work, but Mehdi said he would go when when a window cleared. The walrus guys were like, we can't go study walrus for whatever reason. We'll go out with you and try to retrieve the tag. So Mehdi gets in the gets in the helicopter and they fly off. And for like so for half a day he's out there and I'm waiting and praying and hoping. And so he comes back and I and he opens the door and he's got nothing. And I'm thinking, okay, just wait, because maybe he's gonna and he shakes his head and he said he didn't get it. He actually heard it. He was getting ready with the dip net. He saw it but it was still attached to the animal. It hadn't released, so, uh, so he couldn't retrieve it. And, uh, and then, so then there was the option I could stay or leave, but it didn't make sense to stay. There was no way I was going to go out in the walrus helicopter. So I, I went back without the tag. And then I, I'm going back to Woods Hole, and I've got you know the one tag that I never put out, the tag full of grit, and I then am going to the meet with the engineer, the crocodile Dundee, to let him know, um, give him a report on how the field season went. And I, you know, it, it, uh, I was expecting him to say that this could be the end of never being able to use a tag again. And instead, he said that he blamed it on them. He said it was their fault for not preparing me better. And he said that, they, that I did the best that I could given the circumstances and that they would just work better next time to prepare the folks going out into the field. So I was able to use the tags again. 
And then uh, two months later, I get an email from one of the engineers in Woods Hole who had taken the tag full of grit, opened it up, cleaned it off, and extracted 12 hours of data from that second narwhal. So it was combined with the two, two and a half from the first one, the 12 from the second one, and I was then able to actually write up, we were able to write a couple of papers on how the narwhals turn upside down as they go underwater and they might be feeding at the, sur at the bottom of the, the inlet, and we were able to record a number of really beautiful narwhal vocalizations. Thank you. That was Ari Daniel Shapiro. As a graduate student, Ari trained gray seal pups how to vocalize, and he coordinated a field team to tag wild Norwegian killer whales. These days, Ari is an independent producer, and he records a species he's better equipped to understand, Homo sapiens. In the fifth grade, Ari won the Most Contagious Smile Award. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have our magazine, archives of the podcast, and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, and Aaron Barker. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, Josh McCall, and Raffaella Bennon. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Union Hall for hosting the show, and to that beluga whale that learned to talk like a human. That was amazing. Thanks for listening. Asante came to TurboTax after graduating from culinary school and landing a job in the hottest kitchen in town. My hands are full all day, every day. I love it. Asante, as your TurboTax expert, I'll make your moves count, guaranteeing 100% accurate filing and your maximum refund. Sound good? Yes, expert! Switch to Intuit TurboTax and make your moves count. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com guarantees. Experts only available with TurboTax Live.